Have you ever been invited to something where when you walk into the room, you get in there and you look around, and you very quickly realize that this is not at all what you expected it to be? Like, you and your, your spouse or the friend that you went with, you, you walk in and, and you think, oh man, what have we got ourselves into? Some of you maybe were invited to church this morning for the first time, and you're thinking that right about now, thinking, what have I got myself into? Or have you ever been invited to something where you were so nervous about it, like you had to even just psych yourself up to walk out the door and go to this thing? I remember when Chantel and I had first started to talk, uh, we were pretty well just messaging uh, through Facebook, maybe talked on the phone a couple times. We hadn't actually met in person. And one day I got a message from her, and she had invited me to her parents' place for dinner. And uh, I remember at the time, at, at this point in my life, I had only been a Christian for about a year and a half or so. I didn't grow up in the church, and for anyone that knows my story, uh, I had been through a, a, a Christian drug and alcohol treatment program called Teen Challenge, and this was, was just after that period. And so the thought of going over to a good Christian family's home with a bunch of church people scared the daylights out of me, especially when this beautiful girl was the one that invited me to it in the first place. And I remember pulling up in front of the house and sitting in the van and sitting behind the wheel just trying to give myself this pep talk. And Spencer, you can do it. You can go in. You, you can go. You can do this. But that was probably one of the most memorable invitations that I had ever had. But there's just something about an invitation, isn't there? Like, have you ever not been invited to something that you didn't even want to go to in the first place? And then what's your reaction to that? It's, oh, well, you know, it would have been just nice to be in, invited, right? We have that kind of attitude. And why do we do that? It's because an invitation tells us that we're wanted. An invitation tells us that we're seen, that we matter to somebody, that we're accepted. And that's what I love about this book is this book is an invitation. It's an invitation to many things, but really to sum it up, it's an invitation to come to the Father so that you would know him. This is not an academic book or a history book or a set of rules or a manual book that we need to live by. No, it is the heart of the Father that invites us in to connect to him so that we can walk with him. And as you begin to open it up and read it, you quickly see this invitational language that's used throughout all the scriptures. And i got a number of verses that we're going we're gonna to read through real quickly here. Uh, you don't have to turn in your Bibles. I, I believe we'll have them on the screen. But I just want to give us just this introduction to the language of invitation that's constantly through Scripture. Roman, uh, Revelation 22:17 17 says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hears come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him, make, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Deuteronomy 4.29, but if from here you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul. Isaiah 55.1, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, all you who have no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Isaiah 55.6, seek the Lord while he may be found, call on him while he is near. Luke 11.9, and I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. James 4.8, come near to God and he will come near to you. Hebrews 11.6, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Matthew 11.28, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. And Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. And so often we overcomplicate our Christian walk because we put the cart before the horse. We try to do all the things and we try to follow all the rules. We try to walk as Jesus did. And we think in our heads that, that we're doing right, the right thing because in our head we understand it. Our theology is right and we say, I'm not doing this on my own strength. I'm doing it on God's strength. Yet we fail and we wonder why. It's because God is saying, yes, your theology is right, your intentions are right, in the fact that you don't want to do things on your own strength, but if they're just words, if it's just, an under, if it's just an understanding, then how is anything supposed to change? How can we expect to walk in God's strength when we don't spend time with him, when we don't 
respond to this invitation that he puts out to us. See, discipleship is not about learning how to live out what the Bible teaches per se, and it's not necessarily even about learning how to become more like Jesus, but instead it is about knowing and communing with God. And how can you expect to know God if you don't spend time with him? See, walking like Jesus and living out what this book teaches us, it comes as an overflow result of a deep connection with the presence of God that is inside of us. And let me say this, for far too long the church has remained powerless when we should be powerful, but the problem isn't that we don't know or understand what we have inside of us. We know what we have inside of us. We've heard Romans 8.11 many times. Uh, Pastor Christian even just said that. We know that the Spirit of God lives inside of us, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. But the problem is not an understanding. The problem is we don't know how to access that presence. And how can we expect to access that presence if we don't spend time with him? What do we expect? How much more fruitful the Christian walk would be if our starting point was always responding to this invitation of prayer, this invitation where God says, come to me. And this morning as we talk about prayer, I'd like to do so by setting a higher standard for our definition as to what it is. I think this is, it, this is important because in our culture, I think we've set a, a low standard. We've set a weak standard for what prayer actually means. Our perception of prayer has been formed by the way you know, that we say grace before our meals or before we say a couple uh, rehearsed sentences before we go to bed. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing these things, but I believe it has shaped the way that we think about prayer. And it's made it this casual, almost flippant, rehearsed thing that we, we know that we're just supposed to do. And so for the sake of my references this morning, understand that when I'm talking about prayer, I'm talking about an intentional focused, and personal conversation that you're having with the God of all creation. A conversation that involves your spirit intimately connected to God's spirit. And sometimes it's, it's not even something that involves words. It's simply just an acknowledgement of being with him, an openness and availability that you have towards him. Let me give you a bit of an example of a couple different kinds of conversations this morning. Mark, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on you for a minute if that's okay. Okay, so Mark and I are going to have a couple different conversations. So, hey Mark, how you doing this morning? How you doing this morning, Mark? It's good, it's good. Sorry, what'd you say? What'd you say? Oh, you're doing good? Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. So that's conversation number one. This is conversation number two. How you doing this morning, Mark? It's good to see you. You look good. I like that shirt. It's really good. But we see the difference in the intentionality. And I think sometimes in our prayer life, that's what God sees in our conversation. One being just this casual thing that we, we throw up there that we're not even really paying attention. We're distracted in the first place. But the difference is when we make it intentional and focused and our heart and our vision is set upon God's face. So I have two categories of, of prayer that I want to talk about this morning, uh, or two forms of prayer. And within each of those categories, uh, there's a number of different subcategories as well. The first category that we'll talk about is petitionary prayer. And so this is basically prayer in which we are asking God for something. Within this, you can also break it down into two other categories, one being intercessory prayer, where you're essentially asking God for something on behalf of another person or another people group. We see an example of this in John 17, where Jesus is praying to the Father on behalf of the disciples and the believers. And so Jesus is interceding to the Father on behalf of the believers. The second su subcategory within petitionary prayer is prayer of supplication. And so this is similar, uh, but this is something where we would be praying and asking God for something for ourselves. We see an example of this in Luke 22, 42, where Jesus prays, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And so this is Jesus asking the Father for something for himself. The second category that we're going to talk about is, is really a category that I've kind of just made up. I've never heard this actually referenced before, but I just put a name on it to kind of describe what it is that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, and it's called intimate prayer. And so this is basically just any other sort of prayer that its purpose is to simply just be with God and to know him. That's its purpose. And so there's a number of categories that can fit into this, one in which is praise and worship, like we just did, 
Because essentially when we're singing these songs, we're singing them to God. It's communication with him. It's being with him. Another category that you could put into this would be prayers of thanksgiving. And so when you're just thanking the Lord for things that he's blessed you with, things that he's done in your life. Listening prayer is another category that can go into this where, of course, the purpose is to just be quiet and listen to what God is saying. Uh, Another category which is not really talked about as much and we probably don't do it as much because we don't necessarily understand it and it's soaking prayer. And this is essentially just being in God's presence, just soaking in his presence. And and, uh, it could be just sitting there really doing nothing, not necessarily talking or not necessarily even listening per se. Uh, That might not be its its specific purpose, but just an acknowledgement of being there with God. If you want to picture two people at a restaurant having a meal together, maybe they're not talking to one another, but maybe they've just decided, maybe they're just sitting there and they're just enjoying one another's company. And so that's how we can picture soaking prayer. And the last one is, is praying in tongues. And so for anybody um, who does that, Pastor Paul preached a, an awesome sermon a couple weeks ago about that. And so its purpose in the sense of just your private prayer language is just communication with the Lord. All right, so these are our two, our two main categories. We have petitionary prayer, and then we have intimate prayer. So petitionary prayer being praying for something, and intimate prayer simply means Uh, just being with God for the sake of knowing him. So first, let's look at petitionary prayer. And I believe that as we begin to look at this, we we can really see the heart of God's character. Because we think that if God is really God, and he knows all things already, why would it even make sense for us to ask him anything at all? Why wouldn't he just do it if he already knows all things? Well, the simple answer uh, behind this is that he's a relational God. And he actually chooses to invite us into the process of his will. So then the question comes up, does petitionary prayer actually change God's mind? Does it change the will of God? Do we have to ask him for things that will actually change his will? Well, I'm going to look at a couple examples from scripture. In the book of 2 Kings, in chapter 20, we have King Hezekiah. And in this chapter, Hezekiah has become ill. The prophet Isaiah comes to him, and he says to Hezekiah that you are to get your household in order, you're to get your affairs in order, because you are going to die, you will not recover. This is what God says to him through Isaiah. And so Hezekiah's response then is to pray. And this is what he says. He says, remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And so this is Hezekiah essentially saying, God change your mind, don't let me die. And so the next verse goes on to say this. It says, before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. And so we have Hezekiah receiving the word saying he's going to die. He petitions the Lord in prayer. And then the Lord says, I will heal you. And so how do we understand this interaction that happens? Do we understand it as God changing his will? I don't believe so because I don't believe that it was ever God's will for Hezekiah to die in the first place. And so when we hear this word from Isaiah that says, you are going to die, we can understand it in the context, you are going to die and not recover unless somebody comes to me and petitions me in prayer. We understand that petitionary prayer doesn't change the will of God, but it does release the will of God. And there's a big difference between that. We can look at Jacob and how he wrestled with God. It says, Jacob wrestled with him until daybreak and would not give up until he blessed him. And so do you think that it was ever God's will for him not to bless Jacob? No, but it was the faith that was shown through Jacob's persistence and his commitment that released that will, that released that blessing that God had given him. Jacob could have said very easily, God is sovereign, and I know the promise that he made to Abraham, and so I don't have to do anything. But instead, Jacob's faith and his action actually meet together and wrestle with God all night until he's blessed. Because God says, show me your faith. And I believe so often we grow weary in our prayer life. We, honestly, we become complacent, we become lazy. And we just toss one up there, for the salvation of our unloved one, 
or for the healing of a coworker, or for the restoration of her marriage or whatever it is. And we just kind of expect that God will honor our dispassionate prayer or we don't even believe that he'll answer it in the first place and we just do it because we know we're supposed to. Let me ask you this question. If you knew with 100% certainty that God would answer your prayer, whether it would be for an unsaved loved one or whatever the case is, if you knew that if you made praying this prayer your number one priority in life and gave every spare minute to it, if you knew that with 100%, if you did that, that he would answer it, would you do it? Would you do it? And so I don't say this this morning to make any 100% guarantees on anything of what God will and won't do. But I do say it to challenge the way that we think about our commitment to prayer. Let's look at Luke 11, verse 5 to, to 10. Here we see Jesus teaching on prayer, and really he's, he's talking about this specific thing. Starting in verse 5. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then to the one inside, then the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him the bread because he is a friend. Yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. And so in this parable, we see that the reason the friend gives in and opens the door and gives him the bread is because of the man's boldness. And in other translations, that word boldness is translated into persistence. And what is it that the man's persistence shows the friend? Well, it shows him that he's serious. It shows him that he's desperate, that he's very much in need, and he's willing to do whatever it takes to get what he needs. And then Jesus sums up the parable by instructing us, saying, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. Now we do understand this, of course, in the context of asking with proper motives. James 4.3 says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you spend what you get on your pleasures. And we also understand it in the context of praying into God's will, as in how Jesus prays in Luke 22.42, where he prays, take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. And I believe that this prayer is so fascinating because Jesus is praying into the Father's will, and we know that what he asks for actually isn't answered as he asks it. And this is Jesus asking the Father, and it's not, not answered the way that he's asking for it. But he's saying, but not my will, but your will be done. But this is the powerful realization that I had about this scripture, is that it did not stop him from asking. It didn't stop him from asking. He still asked. Because, see, it's not our job to fully understand God's will. It's not our job to really do anything. Our job is to have faith and to ask and to let the Lord do what he's going to do and allow him to release his will. But we need to not allow these opportunities to pass us by because of our complacency, because of our lack of commitment to ask, or because of our lack of faith. All right, so the second category of prayer that I'm going to talk about is this idea of intimate prayer. And I really want to zone in on this because, honestly, my life has been radically transformed by grabbing a hold of this over the last couple of years. And I believe that as individuals, if we can grab a hold of this, then so many of our personal struggles and problems would fade and, and just disappear. And it goes back to where we started with it saying that living like Jesus only comes as a result of knowing him more and more. And knowing him more and more comes as a result of spending quality time with him. We need to understand this, but what does quality time mean? Well, it means that intentional, that focused, not being distracted kind of attitude that we have, just like in that conversation between Mark and I. It's that going before him, looking at him, putting our face upon him, and having that conversation. Now, we understand that doing this and making a dedication where we are going to carve out time every day to 
to spend with God in prayer. Although it's very simple, it really is very simple, we know that it is not easy. Many of us have struggled with it. It's something that we've always wrestled with. But we need to understand that the more that we do it, the hungrier we will become for it, the more we will press into it. Brother Lawrence, in his classic book from the 17th century, The Practice of the Presence of God, stated this. He said, that in order to form a habit of conversing with God continually and referring all we do to him, we must first apply to him with some diligence. But that after a little care, we should find his love inwardly excite us to it without any difficulty. And so in other words, as we first start to adjust our lives around this habit of spending time with God, we know that it might feel a little challenging. It might, might be difficult at first. But as we push through that, we will come to a place where we look forward to it. Really, and then come to a place where there's nothing that we would actually rather be doing than spending time in prayer with the Lord. And I believe the reason for this, that as we push through it and as we, as we go, that it becomes more exciting is because we start to see the fruit of the Spirit developed in our life from spending time with God. And I bet if I was to pull everybody in this room, or if we even went out onto the street and started to ask people this question, that we would probably get similar answers. The question being, if you could have anything in this world, anything at all, if you could have one thing, what would it be? I bet you some of the answers that we would get would be peace, would be joy, patience, self-control, all of the fruit of the Spirit. That's what people are really longing for. Even as church people, that's what we're longing for, right? We want those fruit of the Spirit lived out in our life. But how are we going to have them produced in our life if we're not going to the source of the one that gives them to us? And so I say, the more that we spend in God's presence in prayer, the more time we spend with him, quality time we spend with him, the more we see the fruit of the Spirit begin to start. And that's why I say that if we grabbed a hold of this idea of this intimate prayer of just being with God for the sake of knowing him, for the sake of knowing his heart, we would just be so engulfed in it and become so excited about it because these things would begin to happen and we would see all around us and, and what struggles used to be struggles wouldn't become struggles anymore. They would begin to just fall off and we would find ourselves down the road, you know, months later thinking, oh wow, I don't, I don't struggle with that anymore. That's not an issue in my life. I haven't even actually thought about it in a long time. See, we try to spend so much time putting ourselves into different programs, into different systems, and reading different books that are going to help us overcome this or overcome that, when in reality, God is just saying, come to me. I just want you to be with me. We're not even going to talk about that. We're not even going to, we're not even going to pursue it. We're just going to be together and God say, okay, now I'm going to take it from you. Isn't that simple? It's, like, it's, it's actually mind-blowing to me sometimes. And I find myself, when I, when I start to forget about this, and I start to try and like, figure out ways to change this specific thing in my life, and then it's like, oh my goodness, if I just took all of this time that I'm spending doing this, and just sat down in prayer and spent it with God, I would get so much further along the road. And I believe that if our church, again, can grab a hold of this, first it's going to change us individually, and then corporately, our church will be completely transformed because we're going to have a church that's full of people that are just flowing in the fruit of the Spirit, people that are actually happy, people that are actually joyful and living in peace, and we're going to see marriages restored, and we're going to see people broken off from addictions of all kinds. Honestly, one of the most prevalent things in our society today is sexual addiction and pornography and these things, and, and the, everybody is trying to figure out how to overcome this. There's so many people that are struggling with this issue. And I wasn't even going to even bring this up this morning, but you know what? The answer is the presence of Jesus, the presence of God. It's that simple. It's not, you know, there's so many other things you could try to do, but if you would just dedicate yourself to that, if you're here this morning and that's something that's living inside of you, go to Jesus. And, and I don't say go to Jesus as some just like catchphrase, right? We could say that sometimes as just some cliche. I don't say it in that sense. I say it in the actually go to him every single day and spend time with him, specifically with him. Yeah. That's what I mean by that. I don't just say it flippantly. I, I mean, yes, go to him and spend time with him for long periods of time if you have to.
So let's get a little practical with this. What can we start today to begin to implement some of these things in our lives? I understand, obviously, that we're all at different places in our journey. We're all at different places in life. But the beautiful thing is, is we can all grab a hold of something today. So even if, even if you are brand new on this journey of faith, even if you've been walking with the Lord for years, even if today is the first day that you've actually met Jesus and you're going to make a commitment today to follow him, this is a great place to start because you might be thinking, I don't understand all of this. Well, you don't have to understand it all. But you can understand this one thing is that to go to the Lord in prayer. And so I'm not saying this morning that, you know, every single one of us have to start by spending X amount of time in prayer at this time of day and do this exact same thing. We need to start where we're at, but we need to start with something. And so if you're here this morning and you don't spend any time in prayer at all, ever, then say, you know what, for the next week I'm going to take five minutes every day and I'm going to just set that aside. I'm going to start there and I'm going to give five minutes of intentional focus time to God in prayer. That's what I'm going to start with. And I promise you, if you start there, probably a week later, you'll be like, okay, this is good. Now I'm going to do more and do more and do more. If you're here this morning and you spend 10 minutes a day in distracted prayer every day where you just kind of, you're going through the motions, well, make it a point to say, you know what, I'm going to spend 10 minutes a day in prayer, but I'm going to do it with focus, with intentionality. If you're Spending a half an hour of time of prayer every day, well, say you're going to spend 45 minutes or whatever the case is. You, you know what I'm saying. You understand what I mean is just that we need to be intentional and we always need to be moving forward because the more that we do it, the more we'll be hungry for it and the more fruit that we'll see produced in our lives. You know, I get really excited about this and passionate about it because honestly, over the past two years, God has done some incredible things in my life through the direct result of what I'm talking about. Completely, completely transformed me. In fact, the moment um, in which I knew that I was called by the Lord to go into pastoral ministry was in a time of this intimate prayer. And uh, it was about two years ago. And so I was starting to have this stir and this hunger for prayer inside of me. And so I was kind of taking it slow and little by little. But then at this point, I was still working at Teen Challenge. Uh, so I was working in ministry, but not in a pastoral role. And um, there was a church in Halifax that had reached out to me and inquired about me coming onto staff with them uh, in a pastoral role. And up to this point, that had never been on my radar. And I had never thought that that's what, where God was going to bring me to. But uh, I had kind of molded over. It didn't end up working out. But, but right around that time, I was in prayer. In one of my moments, and I believe it was the start of something, and there was, I just went into my spare room, I put on my worship music, I put on a specific song, and I just started to pray, and then just this overwhelming sense of God's presence came upon me, and I just started to weep, and weep, and weep, and so much so that I couldn't, I couldn't sit, I couldn't stand, and I just laid on the floor and just cried and cried and cried, and I know that that was the moment that God stamped me with the calling to say, you are going to now be a pastor someday. That was the time. That was the point. And then from that point on, for the next year and a half, I just began to be more hungry for the presence of God, to just want those moments of just beauty with God. And so I would lock myself in my room and just spend time with him, and then things would begin to happen, would begin to happen. And it was amazing because, I wasn't sure if I was going to share this or not, but just this morning, so the song... That, that was playing at that moment two years ago is a song that we're going to finish with in just a few minutes. And actually, worship team, you can probably come back up and start to get ready. But there was a specific song that was playing in that moment, and it's always been so special to me, and that's why I wanted to close with it this morning. But just today, as I was at home this morning getting ready for this, and I was sitting in my, in my downstairs room I said, I'm going to put that song on. I'm going, to, I'm going to just pray and just worship to this song. And the exact same thing that happened two years ago happened. And I just began to cry and cry and cry. It was almost like, it was the, it was almost like these two moments, two years apart. And so this, where God called me into pastoral ministry, and this moment where I knew I was going to be preaching, just like collided together where God said, see, 
You spend time with me, I give you the promise, and then I answer the promise. And it's not always in your timing, but this is what happens when you come to me. And so this is how I wanted us to close this morning. And when I said before I started that I believe there's stuff that God wants to do today, it's that I believe that God wants to start a journey for everybody here. Not just some of you, but for everybody. And we're not going to put the cart before the horse, like I said before. We are going to start in a place where we make a commitment to prayer, where we make a commitment to just say, God, I am going to do that. I'm going to carve out that time every day. I'm not going to let other priorities in my life take first priority. I'm going to make this priority. It might take some working in your schedule. You might have to shift some things around. You might have to stay up a little bit later. You might have to get up a little bit earlier. You might find that nighttime doesn't work well for you. So you try the morning. Whatever the case is, you've got to find out what works for you. Oh, you